One of the things that uh, my pastor always used to do, I grew up in a small country church, uh, one of the things that my pastor always used to do, he'd get up in a pulpit and he'd say something like this, he'd say, God is good. Oh, well, we had the same pastor, cool. Um, I didn't see you in the lobby out there. But he would say, God is good, and everyone would respond, all the time. And then he'd say, all the time? Wow, you guys know this. This is so cool. God is good, and he is so good to us. He is. And it's something that I realized a little bit differently. It hit me a little bit different this Christmas as, as life started moving in a different pace with not being able to uh, know what's going on. We, I, live, I come from families where we pretty much know the plans for next year, this year, right? We know who's going to be where and where we're going to be celebrating stuff and, 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 and who's going to be there and how, how long we're going to be there and where we're staying for a night or something like that. And this year, everything kind of got flipped upside down. And it was one of those things that I was brought into a, a realization of, my goodness, no matter what happens, God is so good to us. He is so good to us, and, and that's what we've been talking about through this series, Most Wonderful. And, and our last, our, our last uh, teaching tonight or today is about the most wonderful thing. It's about the most wonderful thing. We talked about joy and hope and, and being new and being found new in Christ so far. And, and today we're going to look at the last character of, of the, the Christmas story that we find in the Bible. But before we get to that point, I, I, I wanted to talk through something for a second. And, and today we're going to be talking about service. And I know immediately when we talk about serving and serving others and service, it, it becomes one of those things that's easy to kind of check out of, right? Oh, we know, we know about serving. Oh, he's going to uh, lecture me to work in the nursery. I don't want to work in the nursery. This isn't one of those things, but what we're going to be talking about is this most wonderful thing that God gave us, and that is serving. You see, there is, serving is obedience. Serving is obedience, and all throughout Scripture, God calls us to love God and love our fellow man, love others, right? And we love God through the worship and the obedience that we have to Him, and we, through the, the worship and the obedience that we have to Him, we serve other people. It is something that kind of flows out of us. But I know for me, there was a lot of questioning growing up. How do I actually serve, right? What is it that I actually do to serve? Um, I'm going to ask Sammy Edler to come on up. If you don't know Sammy Edler, you're missing out. You can give her a round of applause. Sammy is a senior this year, and she, uh, she's in the youth group, and she actually serves on the, the greeting team. You've probably seen her smiling mask face um, as you've walked in uh, over, over the past couple months because she has been all about serving, and she has no clue what's happening up here. I just told her, I said, hey, can I use you on stage for a little bit? And she went, uh, I said, good, that's good enough for me. Um, but Sammy, uh, does anyone know what this is? Do you know what this is? Sure. What is this? It's, it's a ring. That's exactly right. Um, this is, anybody ever seen one of these? No? No? It's, it, could you, you can hang on to that for a second. I want you, while I'm talking a little bit, I just want you to see if you can figure out, you know, like, what that is, right? And, and you know, come up with a few thoughts and ideas as I talk about it a little bit. Um, but whenever I saw this, th this demonstration was done to me at one point. Um, you have it yet? No, not yet. Okay. This, it was, I saw this at a, at a place. A uh, guy up front was talking about um, serving. He was talking about things, and, and he brings this out, and he says, here, use this. And so I want you to go ahead and use it. Yeah, just use it for, for what it's supposed to be doing. Anything? Just try something. Give her a round of applause. Yes. 2021's jewelry fashion statement of the year right here. So, so this is called a, uh, it goes by several names, but a gyro, uh, a gyro ring, a clatter ring. Um, you know, it, it goes, it, there's a lot of different things that it can be used for, or a lot of different names that it goes by, but it has one specific use. Do you, do you have a clue of what it would be used for? No. Not, not a clue. All right. Well, thank you very much for no help at all. Oh my goodness. You can go have a seat. Give her a round of applause. <laughs> now, it's not really fair of her to treat her that way, but I did. I'm sorry. Um, but what this is, is this is a toy. I know, right? 
I, I mean, a lot of, I thought maybe, okay, it was a math thing where you can count to five. It, it's a metal ring and it's got five little brass rings around it. And what this is, is a, a, a clatter, uh, a chatter ring or a jitter ring. And the objective of it it was the number one toy in uh, New Zealand in the 90s. It's a relatively new toy, but kind of up there with the yo-yos, you know, things like that. Um, and what you do is um, you, you sit there and you start spinning these rings around, and the objective is to keep the rings spinning. So you do something like this. Maybe. Maybe. You see that? And so as the rings are spinning around, the objective is to keep it ringing, to keep it spinning as, we, as I move my hand over one and over the other to keep those rings spinning around. You can give me a round of applause. That took a lot of learning right there. I appreciate that. But, but the, the thing that I find so funny about this is no one would know what this is unless you were told. Unless you were, if I didn't demonstrate this for you uh, right here, everyone would be going like, I still have no clue how to use it. I'll be up here. If you want to give it a try at the end, you can go ahead and come on up. But it is challenging, but it's one of those things that as, as it continues, as you, as you try and as you continue to try, you, you can fail a lot, but it takes practice to keep it going. But before you keep it going, you have to know what it's for. So many times we use this incorrectly. We, you know, if you don't know how to use it, you just kind of put it on as a necklace, try to count with it. You know, just, I'm in the band now, right, Nate? <laughs> I can be in the band. It's the new spoons. But we have to know what it's for. And so many times in our life when it comes to serving and service, we don't know what we should do with it. We know we should do it. We know we should use it, right? We've got to use it in the right way. But how do we actually make it happen? I don't think many people think it's a bad idea to serve people. I don't think many people do. We, we want to serve. But today we're going to look at a, a guy... Uh, the last character in the Christmas story we haven't looked at yet, and that is the character of Joseph. The often forgotten, the, the, the guy who, who really barely gets uh, any credit within the story. But I want us to look at him, and so we're going to be in Matthew uh, chapter 1. I want us to look at him together and see what we can learn from Joseph. Because I genuinely think after reading the story and studying the story of Christmas, Joseph had the most... Singularly, he, was, he held the most power within the Christmas story when it comes to all of the humans that were there. So we're going to look at uh, Matthew chapter 1, um, and but before we do this, we need to know a few things about Joseph. The first thing is, he was a Jewish man. Scholars believe he was a younger man, right? Scholars believe he wasn't you know, in his upper 30s. He was probably somewhere in his late teens, 20s, something like that. Um, he was a carpenter by trade. Uh, and I always grew up thinking that meant he, was work, he worked with, you know, uh, lumber and he, he carved wood and things like that. Um, most likely, that's not what it was. He was most likely a stone worker, right? Trees were scarce in the area that he lived. And so he really kind of grew up probably, most likely, um, working with stone. He may have worked with, with lumber and things like that. But there wouldn't have been enough to keep him in a full-time job only working with lumber. Um, it'd be kind of like a surf instructor in Ohio. You know what I'm saying? Like, you might be able to do it, but you're not going to be able to do it well, right? Um, he was from the line of David, which is why he went to Bethlehem, right? Had to go to Bethlehem for the census. And, and the Bible talks about how he was a righteous man. He was a good guy. He was a great guy, and he kind of had the world in front of him, the world at his fingertips. And so we're going to start in Matthew chapter 1, uh, verse 18. It's on the screens or in your, uh, or in your uh, devices. But here's what it says. This is how Jesus the Messiah was born. His mother Mary was engaged to be married to Joseph. That's him. But before the marriage took place, while she was still a virgin, she became pregnant through the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, I think a lot of times we just, you know, we kind of read this. It's kind of like the genealogy of Jesus, you know, just, oh, yeah, that happened. Good. All right. And then move on to the good stuff. But I think it's very important for us to understand a little bit about Jew the Jewish customs of marriage. So they, it says they was engaged to be married to jo she was engaged to be married to Joseph. And in that, I don't like the word engagement there most of the time because it really sells it short what it actually was. Because in the Jewish culture, uh, uh, weddings came in three parts. The first part was the betrothal, which is actually what this is. Mary was betrothed to Joseph. 
betrothed to be married. And what would happen there is there would actually be a ceremony. It wasn't just Joseph got down on one knee and said, would you marry me? There was a lot of time, effort, and energy put into this from the families, from the individuals to, to make this marriage happen. Everyone agreed that it would be good for both parties. For the families, the extended families, for the individuals, everybody agreed this. And so what they would do is they would come together and they would have a ceremony. And at that point of betrothal, where they would vow to each other, they were actually married. There was actually a marriage. Legally, they were married. But they left that, they left that ceremony, they left that, that vow exchange, and they went back to live their lives as they did previously. They didn't, they didn't move in together. Um, nothing really changed a whole lot other than the commitment was made. The only thing that changed was the direction of the next year because that was, that was the next phase. So you have the betrothal and then you have the waiting period. The waiting period in the Jewish custom for, for a marriage happened and it generally took a year to two years because what they said is, this is going to happen. This marriage is going to take place and we're all excited about it. And for the next year, we're going to throw the biggest party that we can throw. That was the celebration, the wedding feast that we hear about. So this, this wedding feast wasn't just something that they could run out to Costco and get everything in bulk and invite the family and friends. It, it took place with all of their family and friends, all of their community, all of their relatives, all of their neighborhood. Everybody was invited to this, and it took a long time to prepare for a wedding of that size, a party of that size to last seven days. They needed food. They just couldn't run over and, and, and get the lamb chops, you know, from Costco or Walmart or anything like that. They just couldn't ground up a whole bunch of uh, beef patties or anything like that, throw some hot dogs on the grill, they had to count. They had to raise the lambs. They had to raise whatever they were going to consume. They had to raise it. They had to build it. They had planted the grapes in order to have enough wine for the entire party, for the entire community. They had to count their costs and figure out what this was going to cost them. And so both families on both sides would come together and they, for the next year to two years, would be working towards this wedding celebration. It was a big ordeal. Not only that, but typically the man would, would leave from that and start, start working on his dwelling, the place that he's going to live. The place that he's going to be able to start his family. And as a carpenter, most likely, he went and started working with his hands to build a place for a, a home for Mary. All of this went in. This entire community of, of effort for the next year was established. All of this went together. This is what was happening when... The angel shows up to Mary and says, by the way, you're pregnant. And after the celebration was when they would actually consummate the marriage. They would, they would walk away and they would actually begin to live as husband and wife. So, verse 19 says this. So Joseph, to whom she was engaged, was a righteous man and did not want to disgrace her publicly. So he decided to break the engagement quietly. Now, after I explained everything about the marriage, right? About the marriage vow there. So this actually makes a whole lot more sense. Because we don't know how long, it, how long into this waiting period that their marriage was when Mary found out she was pregnant. It might have been really soon. It might have been really late into this waiting period where all of these things have come together. All of these things have already taken place. Um, the, the house is ready. The, the, the livestock is ready. The grapes are ready. All of this work that has been put in through the entire community has been done. And now Mary is found out to be pregnant. There's only one way that that can happen, is what everybody thought. And so this, could, this, could, this had to hurt deeply. And not just hurt Joseph, but hurt the entire community that she was with. Her family, his family, their neighborhood. There was a thought about that that was, that was way different, that carried a lot more weight than just secretly divorcing her or breaking the engagement quietly. The, the quietly part, there was two things that Joseph could do. Joseph could walk up and publicly accuse her of adultery, and where basically that would be like in the court system. She would, he would officially accuse her of adultery, and if she was found guilty, she'd be stoned to death. That was the, that was the punishment there. 
And so Joseph, still caring about Mary, still wanting the best for Mary, he said, you know what, I'm not going to bring formal charges against her, even though you, we can, it, it's safe to assume that most people probably would have wanted that. They would have wanted that vengeance. They would have wanted that, wanted that justification. She treated you this way. We should shun her. We should keep her. We, she should get what she has coming to her. Because she didn't take any of our feelings into consideration. She was only concerned with self but no, he said, you know what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to divorce her privately. I'm going to break off the engagement quietly. And that didn't mean that nobody knew about it. It wasn't, hey, I'm going to break up with you via text. Send. Nobody knows. The entire community knew. The entire community knew what was going on. But she just couldn't be officially tried for anything. So this is where Joseph was living. He decided he was going to do the right thing. He was going to extend mercy to Mary. And in verse 20 it says this, As he considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. Joseph, son of David, the angel said, Do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife. For the child within her was conceived by the Holy Spirit, and she will have a son. And you will name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. I think it's funny here. I think it's interesting here. You know, when angel shows up to Mary, hey, highly favored one. Yeah, Joseph, it's, hey, Joseph, son of Jesse, line of David, right? He doesn't even get, doesn't even get the respect, right? Doesn't even, doesn't even have this, this well, you know, you're amazing, this accolade that, that he could be built up. He had a dream that is exactly what many of us in here would want. We would want God to show up right here in our dream and say, hey, listen, here's, what I, here's exactly what I want you to do. Take notes, because I'm going to tell you exactly what's happening. I'm going to tell you exactly what hap- what's happening here. See, Joseph knew the history And he was willing to grant mercy to Mary because that's what he knew God wanted him to do. He knew he should be a people of mercy. He should be a people of kindness. And being a righteous man, being somebody who who knew the scriptures and knew he was wrong, he he went over in addition to and said, you know what? I'm going to extend mercy to this. I'm going to break off the engagement because I I don't think there's a way forward here. But I'm going to do it in the kindest way possible. And after he did that, that's when the angel of the Lord showed up. He's going off book. He's going going crazy. The angel shows up and said, I want you to do something different. You're doing what you're supposed to be doing. You're doing what the word says, but I want you to do something different in addition. Now, if I was Joseph, man, I'd be asking some serious questions. And he he wouldn't have been in bad company. There's a litany of people before him that he had studied through Scripture that had questions when God told them to do something. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, they had questions. Moses had questions. You mean I'm going to be the one to free the people? Jonah had questions. Samuel had questions. David had questions. Nicodemus had questions. Zechariah and Elizabeth had questions. Mary had questions. Everyone had questions. But listen to this next part, verse 34. Joseph Joseph was ready. He could have easily had a whole bunch of questions, but here's this. When Joseph woke up, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded. He took Mary as his wife, but he did not have sexual relations with her until her son was born, and Joseph named him Jesus. Throughout the entirety of Scripture, we have zero account of Joseph speaking. Throughout the entirety of Scripture, we don't have any account of Joseph saying anything. Joseph was a man of action. Joseph Joseph was the guy who, as soon as God said something, he did what he said. He did exactly what he said. See, Joseph was used to obeying what God told him to do. And so he immediately went into action. He woke up and did. I have a tendency a lot of times to start thinking and and processing and playing and replaying things over in my mind. Oh, should I do this? Should I do this? And and oftentimes my intentions um, uh, lead to not much result. (laughs) Doesn't lead to much fruit, right? Because it's all up here and I I overanalyze what I should be doing and, and I think we can learn a lesson from Joseph in action. Joseph had the power to change the story several times, but he didn't because he knew God knew who he was, and he was a man that did. He had questions, I'm sure, but ultimately he made up his mind that when God told him to do something, he was going to do it. He was going to do it. I think that is, that is such a powerful statement. Think about it. He had the, the opportunity, first of all, to kill Mary. That would have ended the story pretty quick. He had the opportunity to kill Mary in that moment. He had the opportunity to not marry Mary. 
He had the opportunity to just call off the engagement and just walk away. Even showing mercy. He had the opportunity to marry Mary, but not accept Jesus as his own illegitimate son is what people would have thought, what people would have seen. He had that opportunity. He had the opportunity later on in life. Um, uh, the angel shows up to him in another dream and says, go to Egypt. And guess what Joseph did? He went to Egypt. He had the opportunity so many times to ruin the story, but God believed in him and his action to serve his fellow humans that he trusted him to be the, the father of his earthly son. See, I think a lot of times when it comes to service, a lot of times we feel like Nicolas Cage in uh, uh, National Treasure. We have to find these elaborate ways or these things to go, uh, the, these, these codes to break in order to serve our fellow man, in order to serve what we're, what we're doing. We think it's a code like this to where we say, well, I know I need to do it, but I, I really don't know how, and I'm just going to kind of hang on to it until, until something shows up. There's a lot of times, there's a lot of things throughout Scripture where God has showed us already what we're supposed to be doing. I had to come with grips to the fact that even if God never showed up to me, because I think that's what a lot of us sit there and say, I'd like to be used by God. I, I want to be used by God. I want God to use me in mighty and powerful ways, in, in, in ways to change people, in ways to change the world that I live in. But ultimately, I had to come to grips with the fact that, you know what, even if God never shows up with, to me in a dream, he's already given me enough information to know what I should do. You see, it's about being faithful with the fruit you already have. It's about being faithful with the fruit that you already have. God already demonstrated for us. He showed us exactly how we should be serving other people. With our knowledge and our talents and our skills and our abilities, he's given us. We have a lot of fruit in our lives. It's a successful trip in the grocery store if one rule's followed. You don't smush the bread, right? We go to the grocery store and, and we're not allowed to smush the bread. We've got four youngsters in the house where bread can easily get smashed, right? But the number one rule is don't smush the bread. Don't, don't crack the eggs. You know, there, there's all of those things that we take, we take for granted. We know those things. And then whatever we get in the process, whatever other things happen in the cart, we know that that's the rule. We need to make sure that those things are on top. And I think that so many times what we end up doing is we end up saying, you know what? I just want more than the things that I already know. I want more information. You know what? You know, in order to help me be a better Christian, I just need an in-depth study in the book of Revelation, right? I need an in-depth study in the book of Revelation to be able to, to take that knowledge and to be able to know that knowledge to where I can grow closer to God. And, and I, I sit there and look, so many times I've been, I haven't been faithful with the things that I already know. I haven't been faithful with the things that I already know I'm supposed to be doing, yet I'm asking for more. I won't serve in the nursery, but man, I want, to be, I want to be the Messiah's father, earthly father, right? The rich young ruler had this issue. He said, hey, what must I do to gain eternal life, Jesus? And Jesus is like, sell everything you got. But before he said that, what did he say? You know the commandments. You know the things that I've said. Honor your father and mother. Don't kill. Don't steal. Love. Love your neighbor. Be humble. Walk in humility. All of these things. And he's like, all of those things I've got done. All of those things I've got done, but um, what else can I do? He said, well, okay, if you want more, sell everything that you have. Give it to the poor. Serve other people in a way that meets them where they are. And he's like, ew, that hurts. He got offended by that because he was known by the things of the world, right? He was known by the things that he did. If you want to be easy for God to use, we should be hard to offend. If you want to be easy for God to use, we should be hard to offend. Because offense isn't something that's given. Offense is something that's taken. And whenever something near and dear to my heart, near and dear to my life, gets, gets prodded or poked, that's whenever it's easy for me to take offense. It's easy for me to, to be offended. I mean, think of Joseph in this situation. Joseph was faithful. He was a righteous man. He was doing what he was supposed to be doing. But then whenever God told him, hey, I want you to take Mary as your wife, what was he foregoing? He didn't get his wedding celebration that was a rite of passage in collective community. He didn't get, um, he didn't get any of the things that he had coming to him. In fact, I, I, I'd encourage you to think about this. Does anyone remember where Joseph was from? What city? It's in the, it's in the story. Bethlehem, that's right, because he was from the line of David, right? 
He's from the line of David. So he took his bride, Mary, to where? Thank you, somebody. Thank you. He took him to Bethlehem, All right? Where his family is from, right? You ever think about this? If it, all of his family was from Bethlehem, where, why didn't he have a place to stay? Why didn't he have a place to, to go? A, a lot of times we think of, you know, La Quinta Inn, knock, 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 knock. oh, no vacancy. Uh, it, there wasn't a lot of hotels in Bethlehem. It wasn't, the, it wasn't the happening place. Most likely what would have happened is he would have went somewhere and he would have went to stay with family. And they watch him coming in. They watch him with Mary on a donkey who's pregnant. And they weren't even invited to the celebration. They weren't invited to the, the ceremony. They weren't invited to the feast. And they, they heard what was going on, that, that he took this illegitimate woman and this illegitimate kid that she's pregnant with. And he's breaking all of the customs. And they were offended by that and didn't allow him to stay. So they had no place to stay. You see, when we become hard to offend, we become easy for God to use. But when we're simply looking for the things in our life that didn't go well for us, the job we didn't get, the relationship that we lost, the diagnosis we had, when we can run through the list of the ways that we were offended, the way that we were wronged, exploited, taken advantage of, we become really difficult for God to use. It becomes really difficult for us to serve other people because we're looking at ourselves. But to live as Christ is to die to self. And so what Joseph did is he died to self and he said, you know what? I'm going to be difficult to offend and I'm going to do exactly what God tells me to do. And I'm going to serve other people. Because to live as Christ is to serve man. If you are not serving people around you, you are missing the most wonderful thing. You are missing the most wonderful thing in life. And I know a lot of times we, get, we work this up and we say, well, I just need to find the right place to serve. Or I need to find the best place to serve. I need to find a place to serve that optimizes my time, that's not inconvenient for me, that, that, we, can, that we can work out together. You see, when, when we're looking at Joseph's life, all those things were decided before any of this happened. Joseph said, you know what? I'm going to serve. I'm going to love you and I'm going to obey you in whatever you say. I'm going to worship you, God. I'm going to love God by loving others, by serving those around me. And whether it's our neighbors, our coworkers, our friends, our relatives, maybe it's, maybe it's somebody that you need to forgive. Maybe it's somebody that you need to encourage. Maybe it's somebody that you need to um, uh, uh, help out in a way. There are so many things in our life that, that we can serve other people if we're just willing to set ourselves down Set our pride aside and say, my job here on earth is to love God and serve others. Because that is obedience. When we do that, oh, man, I think, I think a lot of times that God knew Joseph way, before, way better than even Joseph did. And he had set his example. Joseph had set his example by being faithful to what God has called him to. By being faithful in the small things. He was faithful in the small things. He didn't get offended at every little thing. And he was willing to serve the people around him. He was willing to serve Mary. He was willing to serve, he was willing to serve Jesus. And we think back to the day whenever the demonstration, the example was given to us. He wasn't flying blind at that point. He had had a, a, a history of how to serve how to set self aside and serve those who are in front of him. Because a lot of times we like to plan the people that we're going to serve. All right, I'm going to serve in this way and this way and this way, and it's convenient for me. But not only did Joseph do that, and we have Joseph's example, we have Jesus' example. That's what Christmas is all about. He sent his son here to be a servant to us. To be a servant to us. I often think about this. Joseph was Jesus' earthly father who set an example for Jesus on how to serve. As a father through Christmas, like, I sit there and wonder, am I setting a good example for my kids? If my kids serve the way that I serve, is that going to be, is that going to be a positive example? I want to go ahead and have the band come on back up and we're going to we're going to close today with some, some more worship. But 
If you want to experience in 2021 the most wonderful thing, because God created us with a purpose, and this purpose to serve others and to be fulfilled through serving others, my challenge to you is that you start serving. You start serving somebody. Maybe it's within your family. Maybe it's within your work. Maybe it's within the church. Because when it, that's, those are the things that have the greatest impact on people joining God's story. It's through people being served. People being treated in a way that God would have us treat them. You see, we will never be the earthly father or mother of the Messiah. That, that job's already been taken. But we can have just as big an impact in the story of somebody else, just like Joseph had. You have an opportunity to engage people in acts of service on a regular basis that is going to have a lasting impact in their life, all because it was demonstrated for us. If we're going to love God, let's do it by loving and serving others. 